2020. What's our place in this beautiful country? But before we get there, our previous guest, Ibrahim, Hafiz Ibrahim Musa, who is a senior researcher at the uh, at Palestine Information Network, has sent a little message. He'd like me to share it with all of our listeners this morning. It's a short message, and it simply reads, the story, obviously he is referring to Palestine, the story is not over yet. Tomorrow, the birds will sing. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I agree with you. Let's uh, talk and welcome our first guest to the show and... Um, last guest to the show. Yeah, I could carry on talking for the rest of the day, but this is definitely our last interview for the morning. And it is with Salva Naidu, uh, the, one of the directors of the 1860 Heritage Foundation. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning to you and uh, to the listeners as well. And thank you for having me on the show. All right, we're going to be enjoying a South Africans a wonderful public holiday on Friday. And I kind of wonder how many of us actually apply our minds to our heritage. What is our heritage, heritage as Indian South Africans? Um, how big a role or how pivotal a role do we play in the shaping of this beautiful country of ours, South Africa? Um, and then also... Um, do we have a place? Do we have a place in South Africa? Given the recent insurrection, given that one of the political leaders uh, passed some very insightful remarks about Indians and their place in this country. So let's start right at the beginning. Let's go back uh, to the time when the first indentured laborers arrived in our country and how their future generations have shaped and grown in this country? Um, look, I mean, it's quite a loaded question, but I think it's important to understand. Firstly, I think let's, let's unpack it and look at how Indians have arrived in the country. So, you know, essentially it's a four-pronged sort of approach. The first one, we look at slavery. Um, and the second, which more literature has been written on, which is indenture. Uh, the third was through passengers and traders who, were, who, who came to South Africa simply to provide for the indentured community and they, they, thereafter realized uh, the value of staying in the country and became citizens naturalized in the sense. And the fourth uh, uh, medium, or the, the last, the latest, the latest one, is through uh, the new generation of Indians arriving from mm. India, as those include the Guptas mm -hmm. and the likes. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I think it's important to unpack um, the role of the indentured and how at every given point from the literature that we have from the 1860s on and how uh, colonial, colonial government, and later on the apartheid government, constantly uh, used legislation to, to, to spurt or to uh, deny the growth of Indians in the country. So we were always seen as what you know, some scholars call as the alien menace. Um, and you know, as late as 1929, you had the Smuts government who wanted, wanted to remove us from the country. And up until 1975, there was a free passage to Indians who needed to uh, felt that they needed to go back. And, and that was a paid passage. So, you know, from the point of history, uh, Indians have always been seen as an alien labor force. But, you know, through my readings, and just last night I was going through um, some material, when we look at, for example, the economic contribution of Indians to the colony of Natal post indenture the, the figures themselves almost triple in terms of the profit margins for the colonial um, government itself and for the colonial planters. So, you know, some of the planters themselves argued that between 1860 to 1866, the growth of the sugar industry was so uh, tremendous simply because of the introduction of indentured labor. And as time went on, more than just the um, improvement of the economy, the contribution to the diverse culture that we have in South Africa. You know, we sit 27 years into our democracy, and I think the biggest trouble that we have with this country is not being able to understand each other. 
Uh, you know, you mentioned before the start of this uh, interview, uh, the plight of Palestine at the moment. Mm. You know, how many of us uh, as South Africans understand uh, the plight of Palestine and, and use that as a similarity or to what happened during apartheid? And, and, and this is where I'm leaning towards in terms of how our history has failed us in, in terms of making a bigger impact to the broader South African community. And I think institutes like the 1860 Heritage Center, the Apartheid Museum, the Stick Six Museum, and the Stick Six is a fascinating place as well because, you know, I earlier spoke about slave uh, migration and how that history has, you know, largely been ignored and how little history is being forwarded into the mainstream narrative of uh, collective South African history. Mm. So, you know, Salvin, you know, uh, sorry for the interruption. As you speak, what comes to mind is slave labor in the time of colonialism, which happened all around the world. Um, Africans from the West Coast were, were taken across to the States and to Haiti, etc. As slave laborers, they were not paid and they were in slavery for the rest of their lives. And it's exactly the same case with endangered laborers. I mean, we were our forefathers were nothing short of slave laborers here in South Africa. How did that come about? Were then was the country not rich enough of the um, native people that inhabited the land at the time? Why was it necessary for the colonialists to bring slave labor from the east? Well, it was a very clever scheme by the colonial planters. They, they, they require labor, and Edward Moore was a pioneer planter. You know, in his, in his article, he had written that, um, you know, the colonial planters themselves were looking for cheap labor, not as, not as if uh, native labor, which was African labor, wasn't available. They, it was available, but are far more expensive than endangered labor, which is why, in their numbers, it was the scheme that was put together by the colonial planters to agitate for endangered labor, and, and in high volume. Uh, this this uh, colonial project of growing sugar was found to be very successful in Mauritius, and that model was hoped to have been um, implemented in, in colonial hotel, which eventually it was. I mean, we weren't as successful in terms of um, sugarcane farming and the, pro and the production as Mauritius was. But in terms of slavery, the colonial Natal in Fiji recorded the worst conditions in terms of the endangered laborers. You know, um, many of them moved back to India where they were repatriated in 1872. That was the first lot that arrived in 1860. And, and, it, and the biggest complaint was that, you know, when they, when they had spent 10 years in this country, when they went back to India, they had literally no money to take back um, to India. And many of them were in extreme poverty. And these were these were like something like about three hundred odd people that moved that went back to India. But the sad reality is when they went back to India, you know, they were aliens there as well because mm. many of the villages had moved on and so on. But you touch on slavery. Okay, and, just hold you know, that the, thought, please, Salvin. We need to go for an ad break. When we come back, um, I will allow you to respond on the slavery issue and then let's fast forward to the current day and our identity as Indians in South Africa. Looking to get your kick? Kiki's have now reopened on 235 Matthews Mayiba Road in Durban. Head on over for the taste with kick. We offer something scrumptious for everyone in the family. Wraps, chicken tikka, burgers, tender grills, mocktails, mulch shakes and so much more. Corporate and events catering available. Visit our social media pages for more info or call 031-209-0119. Kiki's, the taste with kick. Africa. For your convenience, the Africa Muslims Agency's Durban office has moved to 797 Yansmats Highway, Sherwood, Durban. Our friendly staff are eagerly awaiting to receive, advise and share with you the current ongoing campaigns and projects that you have been supporting for the last 35 years. Visit us at 797 Yansmats Highway, Sherwood or call 031-207-5676. Africa Muslims Agency inspiring the spirit of giving shimmer sparkle captivate nothing less than a masterpiece droplets of gold inspires precious design 
Platinum bursts with intricate freshness, and every pure diamond becomes more than just a girl's best friend. Vauda Gold Gem Jewelers, where timeless dreams become a reality. Come to us. We tailor make designer gold, platinum, and diamond jewelry. Trade in or remodel your old gold. Clad yourself with classy name branded watches. We offer insurance valuation and freezer card calculation. Visit us at 534 Ridge Road Overport or call 031 208 9142. Voda Gold Gem Jewelers, manufacturers of fine gold and diamond jewelry. What makes Randery Jewelers the optimum place for your memorable gift? Is it our range of exclusive, high-end, luxurious jewellery? Or is it our master craftsmanship of all your bespoke jewellery needs? We believe it's because at Randry Jewellers, we know just how to make your special moments last forever. Whether it's for a wedding, anniversary, or just a simple gift to show your love, trust Randry Jewellers to make it special. www.randaryjewellers.com Make your moments last forever with Randry Jewellers, the family name you can trust. Approximately 785 million people in this world do not have access to safe, clean water. In developing countries, around 80% of all illnesses are due to contaminated water and poor sanitation. Don't let dirty water end a life. Build a water well. In Bangladesh, Malawi, Nepal, Zimbabwe, or here at home in South Africa, donate to Penny Appeal's Thirst Relief Project to bring safe, clean water to communities around the world www.pennyappeal.org.za or call 031 1100573. Penny Appeal. Small change, big difference. Kids these days are smart, and when you're competing for their attention against their smartphones, you need to make smart choices, like using Sunfoil Triple Refined Pure Sunflower Oil in every meal you make. It's naturally cholesterol free and approved by the Heart and Stroke Foundation as part of a balanced eating plan. So whether you're cooking, frying or baking, you get the great tasting results that'll get their attention faster than the latest app. And if that doesn't work, change the Wi-Fi password. Sunfoil, now we're cooking. Did you know that you can get the latest humanitarian news and updates from the Al Imdad Foundation by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. You can also receive our flash updates via WhatsApp by adding 0825910 as a contact and sending us a WhatsApp message with your name. That's 0825916430. Visit alimdad.com or call 0861786243 for more information. Rejuvenating media day by day. This is Salam Media. Welcome back. It's 9.54 and just a quick um, uh, snapshot of uh, how and why we as Indians find ourselves in this part of the world. On November 16, 1860, a ship carrying 342 indentured Indians arrived in South Africa, marking the beginning of a long and painful period in the history of the Indian diaspora in the region. We're talking to Salva Naidu about um, Indians, our role, our identity, and the way forward in this day and age for Indians in South Africa. Back to you, Salvin. I interrupted you when you were talking about slavery. So do you want to end that thought and continue the discussion? Yeah, you know, I, I just think that you know, the viewers and lots of people in South Africa are sort of unaware of the, the link between slavery and indenture. In fact, in some plantations, it was probably worse off, mm. specifically in, in the South Coast, in, in uh, plant, uh, plantations like Reynolds, Brothers Estate and so on, which is now below over sugar. You know, the, the conditions were that there were so many indentured uh, laborers who were committing suicide because there was no escape. And that was because of the oppressive conditions mm -hmm. on the plantation. Mm -hmm. You know, post uh, the, the abolishment of slavery in 1833, um, indenture was what, what many scholars believed to have been a disguised form of slavery. Mm. But in, in, in the plantations of colonial Natal, the, the evidence of that is validated by the high rate of suicide. And at one time, by 1885, colonial Natal, and specifically this Reynolds estate, was 
only second to Paris. Let 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 that sink in. Only second to Paris in the, in the rate, the high rate of suicides across the world. So you know that that's telling you of the oppressive conditions and mm. what led to people. When you look at the the, the the ages of these people that committed suicide, it's an official list. Uh, 21, 20. Mm. Uh, yesterday, just yesterday, I mean, I read a 10 year, a 10 and a half year old child. I mean, you know, let that sink in. A 10 and a half year old child committed suicide. How does how does a child contemplate taking one's life? Mm. And and it's simply because of wanting to escape. And these are the atrocious conditions in in the plantation. So there's a, there's a direct link. Um, it's not all plantations that were as oppressive as, for example, the Reynolds. There were plantations like, for example, up in the North Coast where you had the border things, for example, who eventually bought land and made a huge success of it as well. So there's there's also that part of it and, you know, the pioneering put it and so on. But there's a definite linkage. In, and the problem in South Africa is that the narrative is that Indians in the country are rich, Indians in the country are wealthy, and yet in the tenements, in places like Chatsworth, in Tonga, in Phoenix, and so on, you you will drive out into the day at 10 o'clock now, you know, 11 o'clock. You see mostly males. We're talking about the age group of between 30 and 40, up to even 50, walking the streets. Unemployed. That's an indi- mm. Yeah, unemployed. That's mm-hmm. an indication of, you know, the, the dire uh, unemployment rate and the poverty in these areas. You know, we get this general sense when we look at the urban environment and, and we go to, you know, the richer towns, like Amshanga and so on. So that stereotype comes into play that Indians in the country are actually very, very wealthy. Uh, it's far from it. You know, and I think that this is where the trouble exists in terms of the unrest and where the problems uh, existed, and largely also geographical. Remember that Indian towns were a buffer to the black communities between the white and black communities as well. Well, so, that obviously was, uh, that happened throughout the country. They used Indians and coloreds to be a buffer between the whites and the blacks of the country. That being said, um, I want to also quickly touch on the 1860 Heritage Centre, why it's important for us to visit the centre and support the centre. But let's talk about Indians today in South Africa, very especially after the insurrection how do we what is it that we need to do or to be doing to close that gap and do we identify as indians first or south africans first um you know there's that gray area as far as our identities are concerned and maybe because of that gray area we've had uh, this political leader um, julius malema uh, you know suggesting that uh, indians don't have a role in South Africa at all, that we are users, that we are abusers. Your thoughts? Look, I, I think the, the first part of call is that to understand that the place like the 1860 Heritage Centre, the Apartheid Museum, Constitutional Court, act as a repository for it, specifically mm. the 1860 Heritage Centre, because, you know, we host exhibitions like, for example, the role of women in the freedom struggle, and the sheer volume of Indian women involved in this um, freedom struggle needs to be told. Equally, the, the Natal Indian Congress, we host this exhibition which commemorates 125 years of their existence and their role in the non-racial uh, fight for democracy in our country. And that's underscored. That's underscored by the, the likes of Malema and so on because it plays into the hands of feeding on, you know, the easy targets and so on, which is what has happened specifically mm. with the unrest and so on. Um, admittedly, there was Obviously, the problems with criminality and vigilantism and so on. But I think, you know, the narrative of the easy target was used almost like a Bell Pottinger type of Mm. strategy Mm. to deflect the attention from the real problem. But that being said, I think Indians as as a whole in the country are sadly lacking in the the historical knowledge to be able to portray and project our role and that, for that matter, uh, colored people and Indian people uh, a role in the freedom struggle because we only consider we don't ever consider, for example, Manfulis Naidu, um, Yusuf Dadu, Monty Naika, Leni Naidu, Ahmed Timal, and um, so many others who sacrificed for the freedoms of our children today. And that's because our history is not being projected. 
because if we don't tell these stories, no one else will tell these stories. Mm-hmm. So this is where we've sort of gone wrong. And, and we need to constantly make sure that we're proud of these histories, but see these histories as part of South Africa's collective history. So we see ourselves as firstly South Africans. That we can't, can't avoid. Mm-hmm. We have to start breaking away. And you know, when I went to India many years ago, even I, or you know, when I was in Mumbai, I said to myself, you know, this is not what I identify. I can't identify. I'm I'm African first. I'm South African. Absolutely, second, so. I agree um, with and, you 101 percent. Because and, when and I went, is, yes, when I went many years ago to India as well, I I realized I'm an alien. I'm not Indian. I I am South African, so I identify with you 101 percent. Absolutely, we need to start identifying ourselves as South Africans and seeing that as part of the solution. You know, MEC Ravi Pillay's famous line is, claim your space. And and after 161 years of indentureship in this country, surely now we can claim ourselves to be South African. Like I, you know, it annoys me when we when we become so patriotic about the Indian uh, national anthem, which is all fair and well. But, and, and I suppose uh, Irish Americans will be sort of fanatical or sort of, you know, very get emotional when they listen to the Irish anthem. That's, that's all, all fine and well, but I think your first port of call is for you to become passionate about the South African nation and for us to call ourselves South African because the solution is for us to become part of a South African collective because within each country, when we look at the United States, you look at Great Britain for that matter, there's a diversity which is the attraction. There's a diversity which is part of the solution. So we, we shouldn't be seeing ourselves as almost you know, a separate to the South African collective narrative. We look at other diaspora countries where there's equally problems. When you when you when you look at uh, places like Guyana and Fiji, okay, and um, Salman, all those experience problems. I do apologise, but we have run out of time. I'm going to have yeah, to end it. But it was wonderful talking with you, and uh, you go well. Lots of uh, success in the foundation, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Go well. Thank you indeed for sharing with us this morning. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Three after ten exactly. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for your company. Thank you for the messages. Uh, Do hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I've enjoyed your company. Please don't forget the protocols. I'm talking COVID-19, mask up, sanitize and social distance. And of course, the roads are madness. So take care on the roads as well. A big thank you to the production team, Mohammed, Nazreen and Milazi Boy. Shukran for your support. And till tomorrow, as always, assalamu alaikum and khuda hafiz. From me, Julie Ali.